So on the first day of class, we kind of went over our definition of chemistry. And we talked about chemistry being sort of like this transformation. Okay? We probably are familiar with solids, liquids, and gases in everyday life, but we don't talk about it as such. Uh, but we may, not be, we may not be well versed in molecules and compounds, or we may not be well versed in elements and atoms, and we may not know much about protons, neutrons, and electrons. But chemistry really uh, involves observing. So I feel like chemistry is all about using all of our senses, and you guys mentioned correctly all the five senses. We have to engage them in the class. Okay, we have to engage them in this discipline. Uh, one of the things that we talk about in chemistry is observations, what you see, besides what you smell and what you hear and so on and so forth. But what do we observe? Okay, we observe properties. Okay, so here I want to go over a little bit of some definitions. So I'm not going to ask you these on the exam, but I just want to get them out there for you guys. So what's on the exam, I'll tell you what's on the exam. Uh, so we, what do we observe? We observe properties. Okay, properties of what? Matter. Matter, okay. So of those properties of matter, Sean, uh, we have qualitative properties or qualitative observations. Okay, qualitative. What does qualitative mean to you? Qualitative means quality. Quality. So the qualities of matter. So when we describe or when we observe matter, there is qualitative explanations, qualitative descriptions. Okay, these descriptions, how we describe things, involve no numbers. Okay, absolutely no numbers. Okay, sodium chloride salt is white crystal-like thing, substance. Um, oil is, I don't know, how do you describe oil? It's uh, orange, yellow in color, and it's kind of thick when you pour it. Uh, what's another qualitative description? I'm wearing a green shirt, right? That's qualitative. My hair is black. Qualitative. Okay, we're going to contrast that with quantitative. So what does quantitative mean to you guys? Quantity. Okay. Sodium chloride has a density of, I don't know, 9 grams per mil, something, something. Okay. Um, what's another quantitative description I have here? Hmm. Looks like I have 5 milliliters of water. This matter called water. Um, I weigh 200 pounds. Okay. Anything you describe matter and you attach to it a number, this is a quantitative description. Okay, my height is 5'9". That's a good one. Okay? That's how I describe matter. Remember, everything is matter. Okay? You are matter, I am matter, this is matter, that is matter. Even the air we breathe is matter. Okay? Gas. The air we breathe. Uh, next, we want to, so anytime you're describing something using a number, so while this is no numbers, this is a number. Okay, that's quantitative. All right, next I'm going to talk about hypothesis. Uh, so hypothesis, um, I'm going to call it a spark of intuition. Hmm. Uh, I'm finding that the heavier I am, the slower I can get from A to B. The slower I can get from <laughs> that end of the room to that end of the room. <coughs> Maybe my weight, my big belly, has something to do with how far I could walk. Let's test this out. Let me get a bunch of skinny people. Let me get some MU student athletes. Let me get some, you know, old people. Let me test this hypothesis, okay? The bigger you are, the harder it is to go from here to there. Okay, that's a hypothesis. It may be true, it may be false, but I just had a spark of intuition. That is what a hypothesis is. It's just a spark. I feel like how much you weigh has something to do with how fast you can go. Okay? So let me get a bunch of skinny people. Let me get a bunch of couch potatoes. Let me get a bunch of everyone to come in and let them run around the track field. I could be wrong. So one thing you need to recognize is that a hypothesis could be incorrect. If it's incorrect, that's fine. 
Okay, so this statement, this observation, okay, think about it, observation, this observation may or may not be true. Okay, so that is called a hypothesis. Okay, it may be true or it may not be true. What if it's true, then it kind of graduates. You know, you guys graduated high school, right? Some of you graduated recently. Some of you, like me, it's been 20 years, 25 years. So when th the spark of intuition becomes true in your eye, based on your observation, you test it out on a whole different sample, whole bunch of people, and you feel it becomes true, then it graduates, just like you'll graduate high school, you'll graduate college, this observation graduates from a hypothesis to a law. And in a law, so this is something that is true, whereas a hypothesis may or may not be true. But we usually describe it in mathematical terms. So that's a law. Okay, after we describe this into in math terms, okay, some sort of equation, uh, then we can test that law and we can test that law into a theory. This is an absolute truth, sort of like the sky is blue, okay? Sort of like this is the truth, okay? And that would be a theory. So we can, this is a model okay, that we can use, okay, that, that, okay, this is a model that um, okay, a model that is used for prediction. Let's go that way. Okay, a model that is used for prediction. So that is a theory. Okay, so my theory is that as, let me give you an example. A theory is that gases move faster if they are lightweight. And that's the truth, okay? It's the truth, we can describe it in an equation. And it's the truth, it's, there's nothing that could controvert that. There's nothing that makes it false. Sort of like the sky is blue. So we go from a hypothesis in our observation. If it's true, we put some equations. That's a law. And then once we have a law, it becomes, we can predict using these equations. And when we predict, it becomes a theory. Okay? I can predict that helium will go faster than CO2. Why? Helium is lighter. That's a theory. Okay? And usually theories have names, okay? like, I don't know, a theory of relativity or so on and so forth. Okay. So this is the flow of science. I won't ask much of this on the test, but this is how the process works. Okay. It also works that way in chemistry. We want to also realize it's all about observation. Okay. What you see, what you hear, okay. what you smell, okay. what you touch, okay. all these things. Okay. We go from that spark of intuition we put it in math equations, we test that math equations, and we put it into a theory. Like this is how science happens, not just in chemistry, but in biology, physics as well. I want to go over this table with you guys here. Uh, so chemistry is all about breaking things down. Breaking things down, break down, break down, break down. Okay, we're going to break down matter, which uh, are solids, liquids, and gases. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, we can break them apart into substances and mixtures. Okay, so let's talk about mixtures here in our notes for a second. Okay, a mixture can be homogenous. Okay, matter breaking it down into a mixture, it can be homogenous or it could be heterogeneous. Okay, so something that's homogenous, this would be like just an example, would be something like salt water. What happens if you pour salt in water? Will it mix? Yeah. Yeah, it will mix. Okay, so that's a homogeneous mixture. So they can mix. Okay, so this is a homogeneous mixture, which is a mixture composed of the matter of salt and water. Okay. So we'll learn in class that salt is sodium chloride and water is H2O. So that's how we can break down matter. This table is all about breaking things down. Well, you can have salt and water. You can also have oil and water. Okay, they cannot mix. Okay, another example is muddy water or water from a swamp or chicken soup or, I don't know, pea soup, something. Okay, anything that is heterogeneous. Okay, so that's a heterogeneous mixture composed of, you know, some type of matter. So we could actually take these mixtures and break them up into substances, okay? Just like salt water is NaCl and water, oil is, oil is a complicated chemical, uh, water is H2O. We can take those mixtures and break them up into substances. Okay? So those substances we break apart, okay? Those substances we can break apart into compounds. So this is real chemistry here, okay? This is at the level that we cannot see. So the substances that we can break apart are compounds and elements. So let's break apart this salt water into the substance NaCl, which is salt, and H2O, which is water. We can break this down into compounds. So the compound here would be sodium chloride, which has the abbreviation NaCl. We'll talk about that uh, next week. And it also has water, which is H2O. Okay. So these compounds, if I were to define them, are two or more elements that have come together. Two or more elements that have come together. two or more elements that have come together. Okay, what is an element? Okay, so an element is just whatever's inside this box in the periodic table. So I'll hand this out, but whatever is in this box is an element. So boron is an element. Carbon is an element. Anybody here going to take, I know it's the first day, anybody here going to take organic chemistry next year or whenever? Okay, so it's all about carbon, a whole science class dedicated to this element, carbon. Okay, it's the sodium chloride. We have sodium and then we have chlorine. Okay, they come together, sodium chloride. Okay. So that's a compound. Okay, I'll hand this out later. Or if you have your own, you can print, print one out. Two or more elements that have come together. Okay. So examples are sodium chloride, water. So there's two types of compounds here. Okay, I'll just tell you this now. We have compounds that are ionic. 
ionic compound. And we have compounds that are covalent. Covalent compounds. So we'll talk about this later, but there's two types of compounds. Compounds where charges come together, you know, positive likes to go with negative. Do you know positive charges likes negative charges, they attract? Okay, that's an ionic compound, charges. Do you know instead of charges, instead of attraction <laughs> through positive and negative, we can attract by forming a bond. Let's form a bond together. That's a covalent compound. So this is, and again, we'll talk about this later, so in more detail, so don't worry about it for now. But of these compounds, okay, we can do two things. We can transfer electrons. positive and pluses and minuses, or we can share electrons. Okay, have you heard of double bond, single bond, triple bond? Have any have heard of those terms, maybe? Okay, if you add a little bit of chemistry, okay, bonds, okay, chemical bonds, that's covalent. Okay, sodium chloride, just, just for your uh, knowledge, okay, is ionic. So the sodium ion charge reacts with the chlorine ion or charge. And H2O is a covalent compound. Okay, the hydrogen forms a bond with the oxygens. Okay, one thing about compounds I want to tell you, okay? This is important, okay? In our study of chemistry, okay, so this is the first day, give yourself some leeway. Uh, but if you know a little bit about chemistry, we know one thing, is that H2O is two H's, which is, what is H? Hydrogen. And one O. What is O? Okay, very good, oxygen. But it's a whole number. Okay, it's a whole number. So we will not have any decimals in our compounds. Okay, it's not... H 1.997 O 0 0.0002. Okay. No. Okay. We round this up to two. We round that up to zero. It's H 2 O. Okay. So no decimals. No decimals. So we're going to put a big X here anytime we see any decimals. Anybody here in a bio major? Oh yes, so lots of bio majors, very good, excellent. Okay, so in biology there is a substance called glucose. You do not need to know this, the formula, but glucose is C6H12O6. Okay, it's a complicated formula for this sugar, glucose, but it's 6, 12, and 6. 6C, C, what's C? Carbon, what's H? And what's O? Oxygen, okay. 6, 12, and 6. It's not 6, uh, 5.99, I don't know, 11.98, oxygen, 5.97, okay? It's not that. Okay, we always put our compounds in what? Whole numbers. Yes, we always put our compounds in whole numbers, good. This is called glucose. You do not need to know that formula. I'm just throwing it out there. And then we'll break things apart again, okay, sideways. We broke our, mix we broke our mixture sideways. We'll break our compound sideways. And we'll break apart the chem these compounds, either ionic or covalent, we'll break them apart into elements, okay? So this is what we see in our periodic table. Okay, that's all these things inside these boxes are elements. Boron element, vanadium element, whatever that's called, and sodium element, magnesium element. Okay? 
of what we see in the periodic table. And we will break up the elements into atoms. And we'll break up the atoms into protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, protons. I'm going to call protons P plus. Okay, that just means it's positively charged particle. These are so small. I think I mentioned this uh, the other day. I do not know if I did or not on our first day. These protons, neutrons, electrons, these atoms are so small that calculus breaks down. Okay, we can't use calculus. We can't use math to describe their behavior. We use quantum mechanics, which is like way over my head. I believe Dr. Fung, he knows all that stuff, so like his brain must be super, super smart. <laughs> my PhD uh, advisor also uh, was a chemist who did all the quantum stuff, so uh, I, she was so smart and I uh, got whatever little I could get out of her. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to call the atoms protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, so the atoms can be broken down into what three components? Okay, and neutrons have what charge? Neutral. Electrons have what charge? We'll just say negative one. Protons have what charge? positive. Okay, we'll study this in chapter 7. We're just in chapter 1, so give yourself a break. Okay, this is chapter 7. Okay. So iron is the element. What is it composed of? What type of atoms? Iron atoms. Yes. Nickel, what is it composed of? nickel atoms. Okay, how are many protons, how are many neutrons, how many electrons? You're right. <laughs> calcium is composed of what type of atoms? Calcium atoms. So they are arranged differently. They are arranged differently. So iron may have atoms that look like this. Okay, something like silver may have atoms that are, I don't know, composed like this. like a honeycomb or whatever. Okay. So, or like a diamond or rhombus, whatever shape. So the atoms may be arranged differently. Okay, so a iron atom is different than a silver atom. The arrangement may be different. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. You guys are right. Iron is composed of iron atoms arranged in a certain way. Silver is composed of silver atom arrangement in a certain way. Oxygen is composed of oxygen atoms. But do we know how oxygen is composed of? Turns out oxygen is composed of oxygen atoms, uh, but there's two of them. Yes? O2. So, and it's typically a gas. Okay, that, at least that's how we find it on planet Earth. Okay. And um, iron is typically composed of this, and uh, we usually find it as a solid Okay, here on planet Earth. Um, silver is composed like this, and we usually find, find it on planet Earth like that. Okay, maybe high pressure, high temperature, really, really extreme conditions, you can liquefy it. Uh, but these are naturally how they are found. Okay, what about nitrogen? Okay, nitrogen here on Earth is predominantly found in this form, N2. And it's usually found here as a gas. Okay, so all of the elements are composed of atoms but they could have different arrangements, and some of them just are solids, and some of them just are liquids as they are. All right. All right I'm going to move on here. Okay. I'll lecture for about 10 or so minutes, then we'll take a break. We'll just go over a little bit of our flashcards, just in, for fun. Okay. I, if you consider that fun. 
but I'll lecture a little bit more here. All right, so um, I'll hand out periodic tables to you guys. Feel free to use one that you may like. Uh, but we will not memorize the periodic table, okay? You'll bring it to the test, okay? We will not memorize it. This is just a, uh, you know, just a tool, okay? You can get a lot of stuff from the periodic table. Okay? You get a ton of stuff. Okay, we'll talk about this later. So we will not memorize it, but we'll bring it, this periodic table, to the class, and um, we'll lecture on what we can get out of it. Uh, some statistics about this table. Um, about 114 elements, 82 elements occur naturally on Earth. You can read this on your own. Uh, some of the periodic table elements are naturally found as a gas. Some of them are naturally found as solids. Okay, the periodic table has metals. The periodic table has nonmetals. All that stuff. And there's abbreviations. Okay, so some abbreviations are pretty simple. Aluminum is Al. Okay. So aluminum as an element is composed of what type of atoms? It's easy. Aluminum atoms. Okay. <laughs> but some of them come from the Greek or Latin. Okay. Sodium. Okay. Sodium is composed of what type of atoms? <coughs> Sodium atoms. But what is its symbol? Okay, weird symbol, and they, again, it goes back to Greek or Latin. So I have, uh, we'll talk more about this next week. All right, just some more definitions for you guys. All right, compound is two or more elements coming together. Okay, what are the two types of compounds? Ionic Very good. Okay, ionic and covalent. Okay, so we will talk about an ionic compound and a covalent compound. Okay. What type of compound involves sharing uh, electrons? Single bond, double bond, triple bond? Covalent. Right. Okay, what type of bond involves transferring electrons? Yeah, we're going to call electrons E minus. Okay, what type of compound involves transferring electrons, not sharing? Yes, transferring electron. I give an electron to Sean, he takes it, we formed an ionic bond. We, I share my two electrons with um, you, Amanda. Okay. We share, she shares two, I share two, we form a, a double bond or whatever bond. Okay, that's covalent. So this is chapter seven, but I'll just tell you this now. Um, usually, who does the bonding? If I were to form a compound, who's doing it? Is it the protons, neutrons, or electrons? It's the electrons that are doing the work of forming the compounds. It's the electrons. Okay. So the idea is, now this is like very fuzzy. Okay. It's very abstract. But the idea is that inside you have a cloud of protons and neutrons. Proton is positively charged. Neutrons are neutral. So you have a cloud uh, of this in the center and then all around it. You have electrons. Okay. Like a cloud. You know how clouds look like, right? In the sky? Okay. So we think we think electrons kind of look like that. Okay. But quantum mechanics tells us they can be like a cloud density. They could be a particle, you know, like I give you one electron, but I just told you it's a cloud. How can I give you a cloud that's fuzziness? So that's where the quantum mechanics all come in. Okay. So this cloud that orbits, orbits, 
the uh, nucleus, which contains, what does the nucleus contain? Protons and neutrons. Okay, so this fuzz, this orbital layer, this cloud around the nucleus, we're going to call that electrons, okay, electron density. But you guys are correct. It's the electrons that are forming the compounds. Okay, it's the electrons that are forming the compounds. Is that my phone doing those weird beeping? All right. We should always try to <laughs> disconnect our phones, but <clears throat> what can you do? That's not my phone doing the beeping. All right, so we have compounds. Let's continue on with our definitions here. Are you guys okay? Yes? All right, good. Okay, a lot of focus here, especially this first row. <laughs> we have a physical change, okay? Physical property, physical change. What are those things? Um, a physical change or physical property. So a physical change basically is something that does not make or break bonds. Okay, we're not making bonds, we're not breaking bonds. So that's a physical change. physical change. So melting something, cutting something, shearing something, okay, even biting something, okay? You're just breaking it apart, but you're not really breaking bonds, you're not making bonds. There's no chemical reaction, okay? Okay, there's also something called a physical property. Physical property is who I am, okay? It's innate. I am 5'9", that's a physical property. Okay, this water is colorless, it's a physical property. Okay, hydrogen sulfide gas smells bad, it's rotten egg. That's, a, that's not a physical property, that's more of a chemical property. Um, or you can call it a physical property. But, um, you know, this surface is hard, okay? Something that, it's just the way it is. Okay, just the way it is. No reactions. No reactions. So hydrogen sulfide, rotten eggs, smell bad. That's a, that's a physical property. It's just the way it is. Okay, once we react it, it reacts a certain way, then that's a chemical property. Okay. So a physical property is just how it is. Okay, how it, before any reactions. Okay, chemical property is how it reacts. So here we're talking about literally making bonds and breaking bonds. So physical change could be like cutting or shearing or grinding. Okay, a chemical change or chemical property is like you know doing something that's going to change the chemical composition. Like a lot of times heating will do that. Heating is the one that comes off the top of my head. Heating something or um, putting something a lot of pressure, okay? It, anything that changes the compound where bonds are broken or bonds are made. So uh, chemical reactions. Heating an egg, okay. Or um, what's another thing that can uh, cause a chemical change, iron rusting, letting iron rust, it's letting iron out. Okay. So these are chemical identities, not physical identities, chemical identities. So anytime you do a reaction, okay, that's a chemical property or a chemical change. Okay. 
chemical property. Silver is very reactive to acid. That's a chemical property of silver. Sodium is very reactive with water. That's a chemical property. Okay? Sodium is solid and has a density of 2.8 something something grams per milliliter. That's a physical property. Okay, so we have physical property and physical changes, chemical property, chemical changes. Physical is just how it is. Just how it is. A chemical, when we start reacting it, when we start playing around with its chemical composition, those are chemical reactions, chemical changes, and chemical properties. So we have physical changes, chemical changes. We have extensive properties. Okay, extensive properties depends on the quantity. Okay, so we're observing matter, the physical properties of matter, the chemical properties of matter. Extensive property of matter depends on how much we're talking about. Amount is important. Okay, amount is important. Okay, so volume, mass, volume, length. These are extensive properties. Okay? Intensive properties does not depend on the quantity. Okay, so on the exam, I'd like you to know that density is an intensive property. Okay, what do I mean density is an intensive property? Okay, density, as we know, is mass over volume but is intensive, meaning if I have, let's go to the next page here. So density is an intensive property of matter where it doesn't matter whether you have a lot of it or a little of it, the density will always be the same, okay? So density is an intensive property. What is an extensive property? That's an example of that. Something that, that depends on the amount. Mass, volume, you're describing things in terms of some sort of dimensions. That's an extensive property. An intensive property, it doesn't matter how much or how little, it will always be the same. So density is the best example. Okay. So here are some examples of densities. Okay, gram per centimeter cubed, mass over volume. Mass over volume, density. Okay, density is temperature dependent. So if we change the de temperature, what happens to the density? It changes, it changes, okay? It changes. Very good. So we have here mass over volume. So how about this one here, al aluminum? Okay, aluminum is 2.7 grams. That's the mass. What's the volume units? Okay, so density is intensive is an intensive property. So if I have five grams of aluminum, okay, what is its density? What if I have 500 grams of aluminum? What is its density? Yes. What happens if I have 500,000 grams of aluminum? It's going to be the same. Okay. So that's what I mean by density being an intensive property. Okay, it will be the same. Okay, other examples of intensive property are color, and another one is temperature. Okay. So we have here, let me just summarize here. Okay, we have some physical changes we talked about. Okay, cutting, shearing, biting, we're not really changing the chemistry. And like that, we have physical properties, how it looks, how it feels, how it tastes, how it smells. We have chemical properties, okay, how it reacts, chemical changes. 
where let's say we make an omelet, okay, the, the bonds or the proteins get all messed up and denature, or we react to something, those are chemical changes, chemical properties. We have extensive properties, which are your mass, volume, length, how we describe matter. We have intensive properties, which we describe matter regardless of how much we have. And the best example of an intensive property is density. Density. This is our best example of an intensive property. No matter how much or how little, and same temperature, this is important, same temperature, okay, we expect aluminum to never, never deviate from 2.7 grams per centimeter cubed. Okay? Density is mass over volume. Okay? Mass over volume. All right, let me talk here about temperature a little bit, and then maybe we'll go over some flashcards, just very loose. Okay. All right, uh, we have degrees C, we have degrees F. Okay, I think we use degrees F here, right? No, what do we use here, the weather? I know in some countries in Europe and Asia, they use degrees C. In the US, we use uh, Fahrenheit, right? Okay, so some countries use degree C. Uh, here in chemistry, we will use Kelvin a lot. Okay, Kelvin. So these are all temperature units. Okay, so this K here stands for Kelvin. Kelvin. So for Kelvin, all you got to do is take your degree C and add what number? That's all you need to do. Okay, so we'll use this a lot. Okay, we will use it a lot in uh, gas laws. Okay, a lot of equations involve utilizing Kelvin. Okay, a lot of equations involve utilizing Kelvin. Another thing about Kelvin is that there's no negative numbers, okay? You know you can have minus 20 degrees C, okay? In some parts of the Midwest, it can get below zero, but here for Kelvin, there's no negative Kelvin numbers. Okay, so. Okay, you can't go below zero. But for degrees C and degrees F, you can. All right, and then this is important for the gas laws. So we're talking about temperature. Uh, just also know temperature is an intensive property. But really, actually, more importantly, you should know density is an intensive property, okay? Because this is a classic example. <coughs> All right, let's go over the next page, then we'll take a little break. We'll just uh, have some flashcard fun. All right, you guys know your units? Okay, so we're gonna use the SI system, okay? SI system. Okay, how do we use, or how do we describe length? Okay, in, in the SI system, we describe length by meter. How do you describe length at your home? feet, maybe inches, right? Yeah, if we're gonna go from here to, um, I don't know, Raleigh, okay, how will we describe the length? Miles, okay, in some countries, they use kilometers, okay, so every country's different. But here, here in this chemistry class, in our textbook, in our equations, in our science, in your careers, when you do your engineering or whatnot, okay, they'll most likely use meter. Okay, and this is the symbol. Okay. Uh, how do you describe mass at your house? Pounds, but here we're gonna describe it as kilograms. Notice it's not the gram, it's kilograms. Okay. Not sure why, but it's, the base unit is kilograms. So we have to convert 
and the conversion is this, okay? It's going to be one kilogram is a thousand grams. Okay. Or you can flip it because they're equal to one another. You can put the kilogram at the top. Okay, so that's something I'd like for you to memorize. Okay, kilo means a thousand. Okay, I'll give you some of these other conversions that we can memorize uh, for this class. Okay, how do you describe time at your house? Okay, so the base unit of time in our calculations is going to be seconds. Okay, but we can also describe it in minutes, uh, hours, years, decades. Okay, but in our equations, what is the base unit? Seconds. Okay, if the question in your physics problem or chemistry problem asks you to uh, ask you how many minutes, okay, the equation you'll have to put it in seconds, then get your answer converted back to minutes. Okay. And uh, what about well, electrical current is that base unit? What's the base unit of temperature in our science class, in this class, or the base unit? Kelvin. Okay, and how do we convert Kelvin, or how do we get to Kelvin? Okay, so that's an equation, easy equation for us to memorize. Okay, one of the most important ones in this class is the mole. Okay, so this is going to be super important. Okay, we'll have an entire lecture dedicated about it, but this is the amount, okay, the amount, okay. Is it the same as grams? No, no, okay, it's not the same as grams, okay. So 10 grams of glucose, is it the same as 10 moles of glucose? No. We have to convert it, okay, we have to convert it to moles. 100 moles of glucose, is it the same as 100 grams? Now we need to convert moles to grams, or grams to moles, we need to convert it. But you see, this conveys the amount. Mass conveys a weight. This mole conveys a amount, how much? What does mass convey? How much the thing weighs, how much the thing weighs, okay? Okay, so this is going to be super important. All right, we'll go on this table. I'll take a little, I'll give a little break for you guys. Uh, prefixes, so I kind of struggled with this uh, my first couple of years here. So I just decided to <laughs> give you guys the important ones in this class. All right, so we have our prefixes here. So some of the important ones is going to be one liter is a thousand milliliters. One liter is a thousand milliliters. Okay, milli means a milli means ten to the minus three, but so milli. We'll use that in this class a lot. Okay. So if one liter is a thousand milliliters, one meter is how many millimeters? A thousand. One second is how many milliseconds? A thousand. Okay. One mole is how many millimoles? A thousand. So the base unit base unit stays the same. All you're doing is playing around with the prefixes. Okay, okay I think we already went over this. Kilo means a thousand, so um, we did this before. One kilogram is a thousand grams. Okay, okay one kilometer is how many meters? 
one kilosecond. We don't use that a lot. Kilosecond is how many seconds? A thousand. Okay, one, we don't use this. One kilomole is how many moles? A thousand. All you're doing is changing the base unit. Uh, 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 all you're doing is changing the prefix. All right, one milliliter is a thousand microliter. Okay, micro is 10 to the minus six. Okay, these are things that we use a lot in uh, our class here. So one milligram is how many micrograms? A thousand. One millisecond is how many microseconds? A thousand. One milliliter is how many microliters? A thousand. Okay, all we're doing is changing the prefix. We're keeping the base unit the same. Right, we can also flip this. Okay, so we can also say one thousand milliliters is one liter. Okay, it's the same. Now, whenever I do my conversions, I can flip it. Okay, I do what I need to do to get the conversions. So it's the same. You know one dozen is 12 eggs. 12 eggs is a dozen? Which is right and which is wrong? Or are they both right? OK, yes, both right. One liter is 1,000 milliliters. One egg, one dozen is 12 eggs. 12 eggs is a dozen. One dozen, OK? They're both correct. All right, let me do one more here. So these are the ones we will need. In this class, okay, we also have a couple of other ones. Um, you may see here, um, 100 centimeters is one meter. Okay, you may see that. Okay. But here are the corresponding prefixes. Have you guys heard of the byte, terabyte, gigabyte on your hard drives? Okay, they have terabytes now. I remember when I was in my thir 30s, like a terabyte, they had a terabyte hard drive and everybody was like stunned. And this thing, I, I swear to you, was like big. It was like this, literally a terabyte drive. And then uh, you go to Best Buy, I'm like, these things are so small and I can't believe it. So anyways, a terabyte. Okay, so what's a terabyte? One terabyte is one times 10 to the 12 bytes. Terabyte, terasecond, terameter, <laughs> tera, mole, whatever. Okay. All right, we'll do some conversions a little bit later on. I still got maybe, uh, what do we, 10, 15 minutes. So let's just, uh, you know, you can just uh, put your pens and papers down and just, you know, stretch a little bit. I thought, uh, but I'm not going to waste so much time. I still want to educate and teach. <laughs> uh, let's go over a little bit of our flashcards and see how much we remember this. Or we'll go over them together. Okay. You don't need to take notes. All right, hold on one second here. We'll shuffle this. Okay, I'm not talking about the element here. I'm talking about the ion. Okay. What is potassium ion? K. What charge is it going to be? K plus, K plus, okay, K plus, okay, very good. 
Okay, so anytime you see an ion, we're going to think of charge, as this flashcard says, charge. So what is a charge? You know, something that's positive or negative. It can be plus 2, it can be minus 2, it can be plus 3, so on and so forth. How about this one here? Ugh. All right, I already gave you the answer, but what's the carbonate ion? Did you peek? <laughs> what's the carbonate ion? CO2. That's carbon dioxide. Carbonate. Carbonate uh, ion. So ion meaning it will have a charge. Okay. And that charge happens to be minus two. So this is CO. This is CO3 minus two. Okay. CO3 minus two is called the carbonate ion. Carbonate ion. How about this? Phosphate ion. Okay, what's the charge? Don't look at that. What's the formula? The charge. Phosphate. You know, we have um, phosphate um, and coke, phosphoric acid, actually, coke. So phosphate is going to be PO4 minus 3. Okay, what is P? Phosphorus, what is O? Oxygen. We just happen to have four of those bound to the P, and the whole thing is minus three. All right? So, like I, I think I mentioned this before, you can use these on the exam, but if you want to get good, you just have to, like, you know, maybe five minutes a day or before bed, kind of assimilate this as best as you can. Okay? Okay, what is the permanganate ion? difficult one, permanganate. It's an ion, so it has a charge. So what's the formula for permanganate? Mn. What's Mn? Manganese. And what's the O? Oxygen. So this is going to be MnO4. And what's the whole total charge? negative one per manganate. Okay. So if I were to take this MnO4 minus okay, what would it react with? What would the minus react with? Charge. So we did one called K, right? Was was K was positive. So what would be the formula? if K plus reacts with MnO4 minus. And would it be ionic or covalent? We have two charges coming together. It would be ionic. What would the formula be? This positive reacts with this negative. It would just be K, KMnO4. This is our first compound. It's ionic. What would be the name of this? What was this ion? So this would be potassium permanganate. Manganate. Okay. Ah, what happened? There we go, sorry. Did you guys get that? <laughs> or did you see a blurry screen? Okay. So MnO4 is minus one. That's our from our flashcards. We just mentioned that K plus, I think you did. Sienna, is your name? Sienna. Um, K, potassium ion, ion, not potassium, potassium ion. What's potassium? K. K. What's potassium ion? K plus. K plus. So this plus goes with this minus. It's ionic. They come together. We form a compound, ionic compound ionic compound. It's called potassium permanganate. Okay. 
right, how about this? What is this called? Very good. This is called the calcium ion. Okay. So we can cook the calcium ion and let's react it with this permanganate. So what's the charge of calcium ion? Okay, what's calcium? Ca. What's calcium ion? Ca. It's not plus one, it's not plus three. Okay, it's not minus one, it's not minus three, it's plus two. We'll react it with this MnO4 minus. Would this be ionic or covalent? We've got two charges, a plus going with a minus. So what would the char what would the it would be ionic because we got this positive charge attracted to what? Charge. This negative charge. So what would the formula be? So for ionic compounds, okay, we will switch them. Okay. Switch a roux. Okay. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take the two and the plus two, just the two, just the two, and the plus two, we'll switch it here. This is minus one. We'll take the one, just the one, just the one. We'll bring it here. This is going to be Ca. The MnO4 is one whole unit. Okay, it's one whole flashcard. Okay, even though it's manganese and oxygen, it's one whole entity. Okay, so that one whole entity gets the what? Plus two. Plus two. So it's going to be MnO4. We don't write the plus two. We just write the two. Okay, so that is switch. Okay, so when we make an ion compound, what do we do? We switch the numbers. What did we do here? We switch the numbers. Okay, the one goes down, the one goes down. Okay, why did I put the parentheses here? Because the MnO4 is the whole thing gets the two. The whole thing gets the two. Okay. Okay, we did another example with carbonate which was CO3 minus 2. Okay, if I were to react with K plus, what would that be? Is it ionic or covalent? We have a plus attracted to a minus 2. So it would be ionic. According to switcheroo, what would the formula be? Right. This 2 is going to switch. This 1 is going to switch. It's going to be K2CO3. What is the name of this? It's Not bicarbonate. What was this called? This was called. Where's that flash? This was called carbonate. So what is this called? potassium carbonate. This is the potassium ion. This is the carbonate ion. This is potassium carbonate. Okay, what would this be called? If this is potassium permanganate, this is potassium carbonate, what would this be called? Calcium Calcium permanganate. Calcium permanganate. All right, let's do two more here. So this grammar, this language, is something we have to try to learn. Okay, otherwise this gets frustrating. Okay. What is lithium ion? Lithium. Not li okay, what is lithium? Okay, Li. But what is lithium ion according to our flashcard list? Li plus. Li plus, right? Li plus. Okay. Okay, what's this one?
Okay, what's f? F is fluorine, but what is this called? Fluoride, okay? Fluoride ion, okay? So what is f as the element called? Okay, what is f minus, though? This is called the fluoride, fluoride. Okay, very good. Okay, fluoride. Okay. So we'll take lithium. And what is the charge of lithium ion? Positive one. We take fluoride. What's the charge on fluoride ion? Is this ionic or covalent? We have a positive attracted to a negative. Okay, what's the formula? This one is going to go here. This F is going to go here. And what is the name of this ionic compound? Lithium fluoride. Okay, so we named some ionic compounds. Let's do one more. We'll take this calcium ion, okay, and we will react it with phosphate ion. Remember what phosphate is? This is the last one for today, I promise. PO. PO4, what's the charge? Negative 3. If calcium ion, will it react with phosphate ion? It would. Okay, this positive 2 will attract to the negative 3. What would the formula be? This 2 is going to go down to the whole thing because this whole thing is, what is this whole thing called again? Phosphate ion. Okay, composed of phosphorus element, oxygen element, four oxygen elements. And this is, what's the name of this ion? So that 2, according to switcheroo, okay, that 2 is going to go down on that whole thing. And what will, what will, where will the 3 go? After calcium. So what's the formula? Okay, put the 3 at the bottom. Now what? Parentheses. P, O. Put the 4 at the bottom. Close parentheses. Put the 2 at the bottom. Okay, excellent. Okay, very good. And what's the name of this? Calcium phosphate. Okay, is it ionic or covalent? Okay, so we named some ionic compounds. We got some practice. And um, just some housekeeping items.